is about the nature of um, work, um, cultural work, um, and the way that is changing. Um, in particular, um, I want to talk about ways in which uh, cultural work or work as artists has always been uh, precarious, uh, always been intermittent, um, but that it's taking on new forms and changing in new ways in the current times. And there are lots of um, questions we should have about this. Um, so here you see a classic uh, painting um, that uh, comes from the uh, period of the 1850s. This was called The, the Death of Chatterton. So at this period, in, uh, particularly in Western Europe, there was a lot of talk about uh, um, the bohemian artist. Um, in fact, La Boheme, the opera, um, was written around this time. Um, so this idea of the bohemian artist that uh, um, particularly um, was um, tied up with a romantic tradition and therefore um, would dedicate themselves to their art and um, starve themselves or even die um, for their art. Okay, so this idea that, uh, that that's really what you have to do um, to be an artist, um, you have to commit your whole life um, to art, um, and um, the fact that somebody might pay you um, seems like um, something that's extra on top. Um, on the left-hand side here, you can see um, a, a cartoon, a contemporary cartoon, um, and the... Um, the people on the left, it's in an orchestra, and they're saying, how are you getting on with your zero hours contract? Okay, and the guy says on the right hand side, not bad, I've picked up three seconds of work. So this is a reference to the fact that uh, a lot of cultural work in these days, and a lot of work generally, um, is on the basis of what's called a zero hours contract, and that is that uh, you only work, you only get paid for the work that you actually do. Um, so you have a contract that says you will work zero hours yeah? and then you have to come into work when the employer says work um, and you will get paid for the amount of time that you work um, and then um, you stop working and you only get paid for a short amount of time. So this way in which work has changed um, and particularly the fragmentation of work rather than that work that we knew about in terms of what parents or grandparents might have done where they have a, a lifelong career, um, has changed dramatically. And the point that I want to make is that cultural workers have been at the fore of some of these changes. Just to say something about uh, cultural work and uh, precarious work, um, it's about insecurity, okay? Um, so that means that you don't have a permanent um, employment, invariably. Um, Often the employees are vulnerable in some way. In other words, they're, they're weaker members of the labor market. They are unable to negotiate their position so strongly. Um, also, um, they don't have many um, entitlements, if any, um, to things like holiday pay or sickness pay, etc. But on top of that, um, Particularly as it's a cultural sector, um, you can't probably see this sign very well. It says, love what you do, okay, um, and love your work. So the idea of passion in terms of work is the compensation for the poor working conditions. And this quotation above here is from, in the UK, a government document, document and uh, it's trying to promote um, young people to work in the cultural sector. And it's, uh, if you like, selling the work is saying, just imagine how good it feels to wake up every morning and really look forward to work. Imagine how good it feels to use your creativity, your skills, your talent to produce a film or edit a magazine. Are you there? Does it feel good? Yeah. So this idea that, uh, that everybody will be encouraged to do creative work um, and it's all about the affect and emotion um, about the work rather than the um, often poor working conditions um, that people are in. Um, so I just wanted to put these graphs up to show you some transformations that have taken place in the um, labor market. And this is referring to the UK, but figures are quite similar across Europe. Um, and this graph on the left shows the past 20 years, and this is full-time work. Okay, so the number of people doing full-time work has fallen off quite dramatically. Yeah, um, but the
graph at the side here is the number of people um, on precarious um, work contracts um, or on zero hours contracts. Okay, so in the past uh, 15 years, this is that has increased dramatically. And this graph at the top here uh, is a very telling point. This is graph tells you that this is when they ask people, "Would you like more hours to work?" Yeah, and that has gone up. In other words, that people are being forced off permanent contracts onto part-time and zero-hours contract, but they can't get enough work. Yeah, so it's this transformation of work that we're seeing across the whole economy, but particularly we see it in the cultural economy, um, from proper jobs to uh, these fractional jobs and uh, fractional employment. Now, what I want to talk about is about uh, what we refer to as the cultural economy. Um, so I think I better tell you what the cultural economy is, um, because there's a lot of confusion uh, about this. Um, so broadly, to think of what the cultural economy includes, it's a range of um, artistic and cultural activities, um, which you could say include things such as visual art, performance, audiovisual, books, sport even for some, heritage and tourism. Okay, so a wide range of activities. But in terms of understanding what the work is in producing culture, we have to know that it's not just the artists, if you like, who are front of stage, but it's also all the people involved in making, disseminating, exhibiting, archiving, preserving, and also in terms of education and critique about art. So all the people working here, um, they're doing all those background jobs that are essential um, for the production and reproduction of art. And so this is a really important point because many of the people involved in the cultural sector um, have been invisible. Um, they, we only take attention um, to those that we see on the stage or at the front of the performance, and we don't tend to see all the work that goes on behind the stage. And this has led to a um, underappreciation of uh, so much um, cultural work that goes on. Um, people have simply equated cultural work with uh, with artists. Um, and that's only the top of the, uh, um, of the pyramid, if you like. Um, so it's really important that we understand this cycle of creation. Many people have associated artists and cultural workers with, um, like the romantic tradition again, of somehow the genius, yeah, that somehow doesn't have to be trained, but is just born as a fantastic writer or artist of some form. But of course, we know that that is not the case. Um, that uh, any piece of uh, work of art has to go through a number of stages, and that might be the initial idea, but if you don't translate that idea into something um, and perform it in front of an audience or um, write it down, etc., then it doesn't come to reality. Um, you become like that first picture we saw of the artist starving in their room, um, Obviously, they didn't have an agent. Um, they didn't get out to see their audience. Um, so it involves today, and in the past 50 years, um, the cultural economy involves manufacture as well. So the making of objects individually, and then sometimes the reproduction of them. So making lots of them, yeah? whether they are um, maybe CDs or films or a whole range of activities. Um, and then issues about exchange, so that might be for money, or it might uh, simply be engagement with an audience. And this point is really important because the way in which um, uh, art, uh, art and culture are, are produced is through a conversation, a feedback um, process with audiences and also with other producers. So this is an important part. And then finally, I include this idea of archiving and uh, education because, of course, if you don't have a future audience or you don't have an educated audience, they're not going to appreciate um, your art or your production. So as most art and culture is trying to produce something new, the audience has to also be brought along with the argument and introduced to what is the new. And also, a lot of art and cultural practice is commenting upon something that is past, something that wants to be challenged in some way. Okay, so this whole process involves a lot of activity, a lot of people. It's about integration. So it becomes 
an issue about complex organizational forms. So it's not just about individual artists, but it's about complex organizations. And one of the things I want to um, mention uh, is the way that some of these organizational forms have changed in the past 25 years or so, um, which um, makes it very important. So traditionally, of course, um, we could always see that uh, um, in the classical period we have individual artists and uh, they would have patronage from um, um, somebody who's very rich or very powerful, like a, a pope or a, a leader um, or a king or a queen or whatever. Um, and then later, um, the artists, um, artists and, and musicians were supported um, by state subsidy. Um, so the nation state um, became the patron of arts and culture. And also didn't just uh, support um, artists in that way, but also train them as well as an important part uh, of this. With the um, mid-20th century um, period, where you have a greater degree of industrialization of uh, culture, particularly through um, mu popular music, and film and a lot of the new um, forms of audiovisual uh, communication, um, there's a lot of commercial growth in the cultural economy. Um, so from the period of the 1960s onwards, uh, the um, economic value of cultural production increased dramatically. And uh, therefore, um, there was a, a balance, if you like, between what the state institutions were doing um, with the state subsidy, where particularly they dominated areas of broadcast, of state broadcaster, um, music and theatre, very strongly supported. Usually, of course, they would support uh, particular forms of high culture, and the commercial field um, was left to deal with the rest. Um, and so, particularly in the 1960s, um, youth culture um, developed in opposition to many forms of high culture, and this was mainly driven by commercial um, um, means. Um, it wasn't supported by the nation state uh, generally. So we had that development, um, which um, then we see the transformation that I want to pick up today, um, which has been towards the end of the 20th century and towards the, um, in the early years of the 21st century, where we have a mixing together of these activities, a hybrid of for-profit and not-for-profit activities. And creative workers and artists are working in between and across these divisions. Um, so sometimes they're doing not-for-profit work, sometimes they're doing for-profit work. Um, sometimes they're working in the commercial sector and sometimes um, not. Moreover, the proportion of people in the whole, po whole working population um, who are cultural workers has expanded enormously. Um, so in most countries now, somewhere between 5 and 10% of the working population are employed in the cultural sector. This is a huge number. Um, in many um, European countries, the proportion of people employed in uh, traditional manufacturing industries like car making is about this percentage. Yeah? Um, so this is a massive change in, the, in the, uh, the perception of people about how important it is. Most people with its history about patronage and state-supported uh, art and culture was that um, if the state didn't support it, nobody would. Yeah? This position has changed enormously, and also it's not just one or two people that are cultural workers and artists, but actually a lot of um, the population are, um, obviously not all of them um, being artists, but a lot of all of the activities that support that activity. But another point that I want to make is uh, this transition, which we could called deinstitutionalization of cultural work. In other words, that um, in this period of the mid-20th century, then if you had a work, had a job in, uh, in television, for example, you'll be working for a state broadcaster. Yeah? And in this period of the last 25 years or so, we've seen most state broadcasters um, broken up and privatized in one way or another. Yeah? Um, so that if you're working for a broadcaster these days, um, then if you're lucky, you might be working for a small production company. But more likely, you'll be a freelance worker. In other words, you will be selling your skills, whether you're a presenter or a camera person or a sound recordist or whatever, um, simply for one job to the next job. You have no permanent employment. 
And this sort of transition is the one that has um, happened um, rather dramatically in the past um, 10 or 15 years. Um, and uh, it's changed the working conditions and the notion of what we think of as cultural work. Just to move back um, a second to the traditional way that people saw um, cultural work and cultural activities was that somehow they were craft activities and as such um, they um, would always require a lot of labor um, involved in them. Yeah? And therefore um, also you couldn't um, get efficiencies um, like you could in car production. Yeah? So the, in a car production you can simply make the production line go faster. If you have a uh, Mozart quartet, you can't make the music go faster. Yeah? So you can't in, in, increase your productivity. Um, so this is a problem for uh, people. However, other ways have been found um, through the development um, of uh, mass reproduction. Of, uh, of music, for example. The fact that we record music, and when you've made that recording, then the extra cost of producing further recordings is almost zero. Okay? So you can be more productive, um, rather than, as people initially thought, that uh, the art and culture were somehow in this separate field. Okay? So we've moved into this new field where, I guess, from the 1970s onwards, we saw, particularly in music, um, the possibility of um, almost um, printing money um, by making music. Yeah? Because once you've made the original recording, it doesn't matter how many extra ones you sell, um, there's no extra cost to the, to the original production. Um, there's a small extra cost with the, um, with the, uh, um, the uh, recording itself. So technology and the ways in which we can achieve mass production or reproduction of activities is also important in this. Um, in a sense, the notion of car, mass car production, like Fordism, um, which was ad uh, adopted um, by Henry Ford um, with the Model T, um, was exactly the sort of model that happened in the 1920s in Hollywood. Yeah? The studio system was a massive factory. Um, ideas, scriptwriters came in one end, and out the other were completed films. Yeah? Um, of course, as we know, the film industry doesn't work like that anymore. Um, it works very much like the television industry that I was just talking about. Everything is fragmented, broken up into separate parts and components. So massive changes, um, not just based on technology, um, but on organizational um, change along the way. Now, one of the things um, about uh, the way that the media was previously organized um, uh, is that there's a tendency towards monopolies. And of course, nation states, uh, as well as uh, capitalists, uh, are very interested in monopolies, uh, either for the extraction of extra value or for the control of propaganda. So issues about monopolies um, were one of the things that we had associated with broadcasters and, um, and newspapers. And this was a big problem because in order to produce a newspaper, you had to have printing presses. And they were very, very expensive. So anybody couldn't just set up a newspaper. You, it was what economists would call high entry costs. Yeah? So there was a barrier um, to get in there. Um, but with new technologies, um, now, uh, for example, anybody can produce a newspaper, even if it's not on paper, you can produce a blog or whatever to communicate more widely. So the means of production and reproduction have changed um, and has meant that uh, um, more people can access different forms of cultural expression and cultural work. Um, but it's changed the way that these uh, fields are governed. Um, whereas previously it was based upon um, the limitations of access to large-scale machinery or um, often it is the, um, the uh, machinery to um, broadcast your, um, your signal. Um, those sorts of things were the, were the, the points in the past. Um, whereas uh, as now, um, often it's uh, forms of regulation um, that uh, decide whether broadcasters are able to, re uh, to uh, produce certain um, cultural forms, say certain things or not. We have a dispersed control system. But this doesn't mean that there, is, there are no monopolies and no control anymore. In fact, it might be argued that the control has just gone somewhere else. Yeah? So the battleground at the moment is about intellectual property rights. 
Yeah? Who owns those things that are produced? Yeah? And uh, what's more, who can control them? And uh, if you uh, notice that uh, much of the debate in the um, discussion about music and peer-to-peer -peer sharing um, um, initially was a di dispute about intellectual property rights. It's, uh, it said that uh, if you stole the music downloading it, yeah, um, then you were depriving artists of their income. But uh, that's only one model. Artists have moved to a different model that, where they've said that actually um, we get more money from performing live. Yeah? And we can guarantee that income. Um, and therefore, we'll give away our music um, so that it attracts more people to our live performance. So there's a different model um, that you can adopt. And of course, the large music companies and large media companies were very resistant to this um, because, of course, the way that they made money um, was through controlling the intellectual property rights. And interestingly, if you look at film companies, um, then, for example, the film company um, Sony Columbia, which I'm sure you've seen at the beginning of uh, uh, US films, uh, um, the Columbia logo, and you know of Sony. Sony bought Columbia Studios. Um, there was no, um, no product there at all. All they bought was the library, yeah? which effectively was the intellectual property rights to all the past films. Yeah? So they their anticipation was that they could endlessly exploit that intellectual property. Yeah? So issues about who owns that property and over what time, and of course artists, that's what they do. They create property of ideas. Um, and the degree of control that you have over that is a crucial element um, these days. Um, so um, what we are experiencing is that these large organizations, large media organizations invariably, um, that control uh, music and, uh, and books and uh, all forms, um, these in increasingly are becoming disintermediated. So if, if intermediation is where they're all joined together and they become part of a large organization, and what we're seeing is them coming apart all of the components come apart, just like I said in broadcasting and just like in music. Sometimes this is to do with uh, an, an economic choice by the um, broadcasters or film companies, and sometimes it's to do with regulation. Um, in many parts of Western Europe, um, regulation sought to, um, to break up monopolies or break up state control um, towards a, a neoliberalization of the economy. Okay? And this happened in television um, very dramatically. Um, and what you end up with disintermediation is the race for where the value is in those companies. And the value is not so much in actually the ability to make or broadcast programs, but it's to do with what's in the bank, which is the intellectual property. Um, because there was a discussion around the end of the 1990s, the beginning of the 2000s, that uh, um, people discussing the media would say, content is king. Yeah? So as long as you have the content, then you can reuse it and make money out of it. Now, this was the idea. Digitization, of course, has led to dramatic changes. As I mentioned with relation to music, um, one of the changes here is the possibility of free, apparently free production, or certainly free reproduction. Um, as I say, um, there was a, a number of discussions about ways in which you can make this work economically. Um, some of them have been, for example, the fact that if you produce music um, and uh, you would have to have a, keep a large stock of the history of mu recorded music if you wanted to sell music to people. This was expensive to fill warehouses with old CDs and old vinyl. Um, and one of the arguments was that actually with digitization, um, you could, on your hard drive or on the company's hard drive, you could have all of the music that was ever produced, and therefore you could, uh, you could buy and download any of that, and there was no distribution cost. So this was meant to revolutionize the way that we experience uh, music. But I'm sure that if we all got our, our phones and compared our playlists, we would end up with quite a lot of overlap. Yeah? So uh, we're still um, forced into this way of uh, consuming a narrow um, range of music. So it's the technology um, there that is an enabling point. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, dictate. 
So what I want to just point out is organizational changes are rather more complex um, here. And what this um, diagram shows, it doesn't matter about the detail. It's too small for you to see it. But basically, um, what you have is uh, at, the, at the top, um, you have the volume of employment. So the bigger the bubble at the top, there's a large number of employees. And at the bottom is a large number of employees. So these are large organizations. And these are small organizations. So the point it's saying is that in the cultural sector, um, there are the characteristics that there are a few, a small number of very large organizations. Yeah, so these are the large media corporations. And then there are lots and lots of very small organizations. And when I say very small, I mean a single person or two or three people working for it. Okay? Um, and this is quite different to the rest of the economy, where you would end up with uh, a more like a pyramid um, structure. Um, what you have in the cultural sector is what is referred to as a, a missing middle point yeah, in this way. And this diagram shows something more complicated. It takes examples of different uh, um, areas of the cultural sector, from audiovisual to theater to music, and shows how they're all slightly different. But that's not a point I want to make just now. The point is, is that uh, actually there is this issue of them being the very big and the very large. And uh, basically, the, most of the employees are in micro-enterprises, um, but the control is often by the extremely large enterprises. Um, so that's uh, an important part of the structure um, of here. Uh, as I say, there is not just this missing middle, but that if you work in the cultural sector, um, then it's more like an, um, what we might refer to as an ecosystem. Um, so what that means is that uh, it's not like a production chain. Um, it's about uh, all sorts of different activities all linked up together. Um, but m if you work in one of these small companies, um, then basically they will be what are called project-based companies. So they are companies which you will only um, work in for one project. So it's a bit like if you were making a film. Yeah? You would get a group of people together to make the film. When you'd finished shooting it, then everybody's out of a job. Yeah? So it might take six months or nine months or a year. But then you have to go on to the next job. And it won't be the same group of people, but a different group of people. So this is the experience of working in the cultural sector, is that nobody has a job forever, but you're working, moving from one project to another project. Um, so project-based companies are important. And what's important here, if you're working in the cultural sector, is the overlapping networks. Because you're always looking for your next job. And in order to get the next job, you have to get information from people. So you're constantly talking to people and say, do you know somebody who's got a job? Can you find me a job, etc. Yeah. So this is a really important part. So this social part of uh, the fact that work that people have to do is important. Also, there is a key element, which is what we refer to as reputation economies. So it's not simply that you are able to fulfill a function in the workplace, but the difference between um, one person doing the job and another person doing the job is something about their artistic contribution. But it's also about what sort of person they are as well. And I'm sure you've all been working on projects one time or another, even if it was just at school, and uh, when you would choose the four people to work on your project, you would say, I don't want that person because they always mess things up, yeah? or they're always slow, or I want that person because they're great helping the team work together. It's just like that in the cultural field. Yeah? So you have to know who are the people that are good to work with and who are the ones you want to avoid. Um, and who are the ones like Harvey Weinstein, who <laughs> definitely want to be with. Furthermore, there is the nature of the cultural economy is what in e economics they call a winner-takes-all um, economy. What this means is that um, actually in any cultural market um, that there are only one or two products that are going to win. All of the others will lose. Um, and this is a fairly brutal selection process. Um, so 
if you are a musician recording and uh, your record or music that you produce um, is only, say, number 10 in the charts or, or, or low down, you'll virtually get no money. Okay, but if you're at number one or the most listened to, then you get most of the money. So this is the issue that uh, um, it's no good coming second. Um, first or nothing um, tends to be the point. Now, this is a really interesting point about value decisions, about, uh, about how brutal the process is, but also it's about risk. As many people have said, about, uh, uh, particularly about the music industry and particularly about the um, film industry, is that the, the, the pattern is that, um, of, for example, every 10 projects that are made, so that would be recording music or making a film, only two of them will be successful. Eight of them will be disasters. Yeah? The problem is, nobody knows which two. So therefore, you have to make ten. Yeah? To make sure that on the, on the odds of probability, that the two will come through and cover your costs for the whole lot. So this is a, um, a way that uh, is for managing risk. And this process is really important. That's how people in Hollywood make money, um, is because they're able to spread their risks over a large number of films or a large amount of music. This process, when we have seen it um, adopted by the nation state um, supporting cultural work, politicians always want the thing that they support to be a success. Yeah? So um, this doesn't work. Yeah? You have to love failure in order to, um, to experience the, uh, um, the best of the cultural world. And as we all know, if you play safe and produce safe culture, then all you get is mediocrity. Yeah? You get the worst possible things, or very boring things. So in order to excel, you have to create a system where you can take big risks and have big failure as well as big success. And much of the contemporary organization of the cultural sector has been um, evolved to allow this to happen. And that's why it's different to making cars or making um, other traditional um, goods. So lots of uncertainty, but that's uh, what is good for um, delivering um, these activities. Some of the other things that we can see um, that are changing dramatically, as if there wasn't enough change in the cultural sector, is that increasingly um, the companies involved in cultural work are outsourcing the risks. So as I've mentioned already, you can balance your risks by having a large organization or a range of making a range of films. Now what's happening is that uh, um, economic organizations are seeking to, um, to minimize risk themselves and put all of the risk onto you um, as, the, as the worker. Um, so companies such as uh, the platform companies, um, like Uber, for example. Um, Uber is a, is a company that simply has an operating system um, and uh, it doesn't actually employ anybody. Um, if you're a driver for Uber, you have to buy your own car um, and employ yourself um, and then you contract um, as part of the Uber system. Um, and there's been a dispute in, in Western Europe uh, about uh, Uber, for example, um, saying that Uber doesn't pay its taxes, that it should give holiday pay, etc. And Uber says, we don't employ anybody. Yeah? Um, so there's this question about contractually whether, in fact, the employees, as they used to be called, are now working for themselves. So this is a way of outsourcing the risks, all of the costs of buying a car, of insurance, of taking holiday pay, etc. All these things are borne by the driver, or in any of these cultural activities, by the cultural worker. And therefore, the nature of work in the cultural sector, but also illustrated by, uh, by the, the Uber taxi driver, is totally unpredictable. In fact, you are responding simply to the, um, to the algorithm. The algorithm decides, um, um, somebody requests a taxi, and the algorithm decides which is the nearest taxi and which one should go and pick it, uh, them up. Yeah? And the taxi driver has to respond, yeah? otherwise they lose their fare. Yeah? And it's like this in much of the, um, the cultural sector um, now. 
Um, so therefore, the quality of work and the predictability of work um, has all gone. Yeah? We don't know where the next job is coming from. There's no sense of continuity, no sense of pride or investment in the, in, in the work. But more significantly, perhaps, is the fact that most nation states have built their welfare systems on the basis of people having um, um, jobs in manufacturing industry where they would do the same job for years and years. What's happening in the cultural sector and also more generally of people that are working in this precarious work is that people only work for short periods of time and they pay fewer taxes and they don't invest in pensions or holiday pay, etc. Um, so what happens is that, uh, um, for example, that uh, if you want a career um, and you want a new job, um, then you have to train yourself. You have to pay for your own training yeah, in order to get the next job. Um, so you have to take on that responsibility um, as well. Um, also, of course, um, you, if you're ill, then you don't get paid because you don't get to work. Yeah? There's no sickness pay. Yeah? And there's no pension. Forget about pensions. Yeah? Um, all these things go. But also, it means that if you're old, then tough. You don't get a job. Yeah? If you are ill, um, and in many activities, if you're a woman, um, or if you have an ethnicity that the employer doesn't like, forget it. So rather than as is often presented, that this is the, the freedom economy, that we can choose when we work, what we work, everybody's happy, you know, just like in some advert for Google, yeah? um, that uh, actually um, this produces a more um, unfair work society um, than we ever had before. And effectively, it's the survival of the fittest. Yeah? Um, so it really is going backwards to the law of the jungle um, almost here. Not only is it hard working, but even when you're not working, you have to work. And this is what uh, some authors have called compulsory socialization. In other words, you have to go to parties, you have to go to networking events to get your next job. That's all work, yeah? Because if you don't do that, you won't get a another job. So 24-7, you have to be on. Now, all you guys are saying, oh, that's fine, I like to party, yeah? But, yeah, maybe not in the future. <laughs> if, you, if you have to do this to survive, um, this is what, uh, what happens. But it also comes back to that first slide. It's this uh, balance between um, the fact that we're being encouraged to take on these new forms of employment. But it's okay because we love our work. We're being exploited because we love our work. Yeah? Um, it's the, the fact that we love our work, we're getting paid less. Yeah? Um, that's what is going on here. Um, so it's a big problem here is that we are uh, um, undervaluing ourselves and undervaluing our social life. So just to give you an example of, this is in the UK, um, but to give you an example of uh, the sort of mix of, uh, of people, in the overall UK workforce, there's something like 46% of the population, so almost half um, women are working. But in the audiovisual industri industries, it's more like a third. Um, so younger women um, generally get paid less. So in the audiovisual industries, there's more of them. So ethnic minorities, um, again, less. So in other words, on most of the indicators about what is uh, um, discriminatory practices in work, then the audiovisual sector, in this case, is worse on all of them. So rather than cultural work being great, everybody loves one another, etc., actually, um, it's the worst sort of work. And if we look at elite jobs um, in the UK, um, in terms of the media, um, news journalists, um, they all have a private education. Yeah, so over half of them. Um, and um, yeah, so, so it's this big division. Only those that are already rich and privileged um, manage to get on this. And there's a yet another step that now um, the transition is saying that you need experience to get a job. Yeah? And therefore, one way of getting experience is to be an intern. 
being an intern is another way of saying working for free. Yeah? Um, and if you have rich parents, then they can support you working for free. And eventually you can get a job. So this is another way to make sure that only the well-off begin to populate the cultural media industries and therefore the perception of society that they have is rather limited um, in terms of the, both the opportunities and also the way that they present the world. So this is a big problem in that uh, even the um, uh, issue about internships, so for example in areas of the advertising industry um, that you probably have to have a free um, sorry, not free, an unpaid internship for maybe a year before you can get a job. So who can support themselves for a year with no pay in London, which is very expensive to live in? Yeah? So this is part of the issue, this hidden discrimination that is happening throughout the population to make sure that only the most privileged end up in the cultural sector um, and there's a total lack of diversity. And I guess this is, I just wanted to uh, repeat that point uh, here, that uh, originally we, we saw the romantic artist, and of course this is a very positive um, media image of the artist, apart from when they die, of course, um, but it's uh, live fast, die young. You know, it's that uh, um, everything is, is fantastic. That neoliberalism has occupied that space and saying actually the notion of the, of the artist has become the new model worker of the future. The worker that will exploit themselves, that doesn't need training, will set up their own job, set up their own company um, and work every hour you give them. Um, so the contemporary debates about cultural workers, uh, people have begun to focus on this transition that's happening in society. Um, and uh, the French authors, uh, Botanski and Giappello, um, have written a marvelous book called The New Spirit of Capitalism, which they talk about this increasing transition of the workforce um, into um, precarious workers. Um, and in Italy, um, Hart and Negri have written about the precariat, um, which is this new class they argue, that is being created of precarious workers, which don't just include the usual ones we think of, like, uh, like cleaners, uh, etc., but also include people like actors. Yeah? Because they're all, they share a common relation to the means of production, as we might say. Yeah? Um, also, it's even getting, uh, there's a lot of uh, academic work that has been talking about the way that um, uh, that uh, um, people are imagining work in the cultural se sector is we think of work as sacrificial labor. Okay, So this idea that uh, we will um, sacrifice ourselves to um, do lots and lots of free jobs in the hope that we'll get that one big job in the future or that we will get a hit or we'll appear on some television program. Yeah? So this idea of the sacrifice that you have to make to be a success in the cultural economy, um, that again, it's a winner takes all economy. So 99% of the people will not be successful and they have sacrificed themselves for what? Yeah? Um, it's a big question about what is the future of good work? Um, not just any work, but good work. In the UK, we've had a big parliamentary review of, uh, of this type of work, and this is seen. Uh, it's referred to as the gig economy, um, that you just go on for a temporary job. But this is becoming more widespread in the economy. Now, of course, one of the challenges with this is that there are no unions. Who is to speak up for the precariat? Yeah? Because they are, by their nature, isolated, individualized, and therefore there is no one to represent them, um, except there is now. Um, so the, uh, the precarious workers brigade, or what they call themselves the, the carrot workers. So you have to remember, you have to imagine a donkey walking along and you dangle a carrot in front of them. Yeah? And they're constantly trying to get the carrot. That's what freelance work is like. Yeah? There's, there's a reward, never quite happens. Yeah? So the free work, so this is, I'm a freelance. This does not mean I will work for free. Yeah. Okay. So this could go the same for artists, etc. Um, and they've written a pamphlet on surviving internships. Yeah. Um, so all of the things you have to do. So 
they've written this little card, which is a joke, but actually is very true. Um, that uh, it's a, it's like a business card that you give to your employer um, or, or give to freelance workers, and it's saying um, during any negotiation for pay, um, do not remain silent about money. Yeah, ask to be paid. Yeah, do not subsidise the production from your own pocket. Yeah. Um, don't accept a change in agreed conditions without renegotiation. Do not take the job on the promise of some future gain that may never happen. So these are just illustrating the way that um, I'm sure many of you have experienced working in this economy. Um, the rules have changed. Um, and um, that there are lots of people who are experiencing these same conditions. And as I said, effectively, what's happening is where... Um, traditionally, a large corporation would uh, balance out the risks that were taken. Now we're being expected to take all of those risks ourselves. Yeah? So we're responsible for our future um, in a very fundamental way. And we need um, support as well. Um, this is happening more generally. And I guess if there's a slightly brighter side to the story is of ways to repair this. Well, clearly one aspect is to, for people to mobilize themselves, to join together in unions, etc., to actually challenge some of these working conditions. Um, but others are that actually the importance of intermediaries. Um, so if you only have the individual worker and the large corporation, um, then they're going to get separated. Um, but having intermediaries to mediate between them and to negotiate um, can be an important way. And of course, historically, um, this is the way that um, much of the cultural sector worked um, through having intermediaries of intermediate production, but also people like agents and uh, who came between the artist and their, and, and their audience. Um, so the issue of having a structure of intermediation so that you don't have to go to parties all day long, um, but somebody else will help you get a job. Yeah? Um, these sorts of activities, really important. So new intermediaries to remake the social and economic relations of work, which effectively have been broken down by this uh, new system. And I guess the other point is coming back to the one that I made at the beginning, which is the importance of owning your intellectual property. Um, so that is to have um, some sort of control over um, what you produce. Um, it doesn't sound much to ask, does it? Um, but uh, part of your creative labor is to produce new ideas. Um, and uh, um, should you give those ideas away to large companies, or should you be able to hold on to them yourself, or have the option to give them to everybody else? Yeah? So this is the idea of the creative commons is that uh, you actually make ideas more freely available rather than what, if a large company has them, they are what are called them proprietary ideas. In other words, you have to buy them in order to use them. So there's a big debate about what the status of knowledge that is produced by cultural workers, who owns it, and who gets both a rent from it or who controls its distribution. Um, these are really important debates that we'll ha continue to have in the near future. And it's not just organizational space that we need, but it's also physical spaces. Artists and cultural producers um, need the spaces for social interaction. At the moment, they're doing that all on their own time, or they're going to Starbucks or going to a coffee house um, where they're doing their socialization and have to pay for the coffee, whatever. Yeah? Um, we need spaces, um, spaces to both work in um, and also spaces to socialize in, to meet other workers. Um, so what happens increasingly is that freelance workers, again, are individualized, they're working on their own computer, in their own space, and they never really get to meet other people, apart from when they're trying to find out about another job. So this way in which people are being atomized and isolated in society is such a problem of uh, a anti-cultural movement in a way, yeah? because we're, we're, we're not um, being part of a wider movement. So there's a whole set of issues, ironically, about cultural work, which is about the need for connection. You would have thought that uh, here is a group of people who are early adopters of new technologies and therefore should be the most connected in the world. Um, but of course, 
um, simply having um, a digital connection is not the same as having face-to-face -face communication um, and having the subtleties of uh, interacting with people, which particularly in areas of cultural production where um, small value judgments and feeling about creation is very, very important, is not something that always um, is transmitted um, in a digital um, connection. So, just to conclude, um, it's a fairly depressing story, I know, um, but I think it's an important one to recognize that uh, whilst uh, most of us have a, a positive view about what cultural work is and that we all want to work in a cultural field, there are many dangers associated with it as well that people are being taken advantage of effectively. Um, the notion of the artists themselves is, is a problem which we have inherited. It's a very individualized notion um, that is separate um, separated from society in a sense. And I think we need to reconnect many of those activities. But furthermore, this field, the cultural economy, has undergone massive changes in the past 25 or 30 years. Whereas before, um, the cultural sector may have just been museums and libraries uh, and theater. Now you have a massive part of the um, global economy is associated with culture and cultural work. Um, and so this is not just a, a minority concern, this is now a majority concern, and it's also about the future of culture in terms of who's making culture, whose ideas are going to be put forward there, who gets selected or gets access to um, this cultural production. Um, and so questioning the ideas about the responsibilities of cultural work um, and also about whether cultural workers should bear all of the risks um, is, is a big issue here. Um, and I guess the, the final point is that often we get uh, communicated to us um, saying that uh, the future of work is free, free work, we can choose when we want to work, but actually um, there are many constraints about uh, this vision of freedom that we're being sold, um, that uh, often um, it requires us to challenge many of these points and for cultural workers to uh, recognize the difficulties of their own working conditions um, and come together to protect one another. That's all I've got to say. Um, so hopefully um, you may have some questions, um, you may have some points to make, but thank you very much.